and we are live, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. This is episode 143. We're joined by a very special guest. We're joined by Dr. Adrian Sebro, and he is at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where he's currently in the, I believe he's in the radio, TV, and film department at the University of Texas at Austin. Mm -hmm. He obtained his PhD at the University of California, Los Angeles, in um, sad field, film and television. And we're going to discuss a really important book that he published last year. I have it here with me. It's entitled Scratching and Surviving, Hustle Economics and the Black Sitcoms of Tandem Productions. And if you all don't know about Tandem Productions, some of your popular shows like Sanford and Son, Good Times, All in the Family, these are all part of the same family of productions. And we're going to discuss this in detail today. And I know a lot of my audience is excited. I just had a lot of nostalgia just reading the book, even though I'm only 42 years old. So a lot of these shows were in syndication, but I still grew up watching these shows. So I'm sure that Adrian did too. But I just want to say welcome to the show and thanks for accepting our invitation. Oh yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm glad we can make this work out. Um, definitely happy to talk about you know this moment in the book and I'm just appreciative of everyone engaging with it. And above all, I wanted the folks, you know, how whatever level they are, and that's why I made the book readable to not just academics, but to kind of anyone interested in this TV history or black history in general. And I, I think that these are stories that about us that need to be told by us. So I'm just happy that I was able to take my part in doing that and, and bring some light back onto these shows that um, made so much of the shows that we see now is because of these shows in the past. So I'm just thankful to be in conversation with you. I appreciate that. Yes. I know my audience is going to be excited too, just to get this history lesson kind of a uh, roll back the clock some of the yeah. tv shows of our time and i know a lot of people are like uh, all my friends have heard of these shows before even some of the younger generation uh then they're or at least aware of these shows sanford and son and all in family and the jeffersons and and what have you but i just want to give a brief ad and just say that i want to say thanks to all the beautiful people in the world we have about 42 percent of our audience outside of the united states and that was always the point of kiko's free thinkers forum to make this an international community forum and we have a bunch of guests coming on down the road. But I just want to tell people, subscribe, share the information with your friends and family. It doesn't cost you a dime, just a little bit of time to expand your mind. And remember, you can't unthink free thought. And this is simply my way of kind of educating the public, bring people on that can give us this insight. And we're growing together here at the forum. It's not just political. We have cultural issues we attack. And I think you got to have everything together. And I think there's something here genuinely for everybody. You know, it doesn't matter what persuasion you're in. I think that there's something that could interest you if you open your mind to it. I guess my first question for you, Adrian, is mm -hmm. what is a black sitcom? How would you explain that to the audience? Yeah. So um, it's funny when writing the book, that's kind of the first thing I have to lay, lay flat, like what the black sitcom is. And so I've contextualized it as a sitcom that, um, majority of black casts or the black or the star is black but also is really particularly about the um the content of the show like uh, does it talk about black social issues black community um black political progress so really it's a matter of the casting as well as the content um so none of these shows were created by well actually let me not say that none of these shows were executive produced or ran by black individuals. However, um, these shows are very clearly black in the, in the, in the um, instance of their uh, the casting makeup, the central characters, as well as the um, the content and the, the neighborhoods they live in, the their social environment, the, the political conversations. All those are very much black. So it doesn't necessarily need to have a black creator at the helm, but particularly um, individuals who are black in the star star role who actually have the star power to change some things on set uh, to make them more relevant to themselves. So that's a black show to me, the, the content and the characters. You alluded to the fact um, we're talking about Tanner Productions here, which I believe started in the 50s. Yes, correct. And why did two Jewish men in Bud Yorkin and Norm, Norman Lear take such an interest in doing this, having this kind of conception? Yeah, so Bud York and Norman Lee are very important to TV history, right? Um, you know, it can't be denied with their impact. You know, Norman Lee is the name that's known much more largely than Bud Yorkin, but I made it clear, especially in tandem, you know, they're both a part of it. No matter of how much we know Norman Lee or Bud Yorkin was there as well, too. So had to make sure that I include both of them in the conversation. But um, 
they met on like Colgate Comedy Hour, kind of a variety show in I think mid 1955, and they came together. Yorkin's more the technical, the director type, and um, Lear's the the thinker, the writer, the producer, the, the action man, the face, right? So the with them, they had you know a string of t uh, films like you know Cold Turkey uh, being one of them, you know, um, with you know Frank Sinatra as well. So different small films that came about that didn't necessarily want to get, gain the success they wanted to. They realized that TV was the medium that they felt was the best for them. Um, so what happened with that was they decided to uh, come up with a show about the times. So for them, very liberal thinkers themselves, you know, uh, they were in the army beforehand. They did their time there and they came back to the U S and realized that they enjoy writing about society, writing about the, the norms of society, how society is changing. So for them, it was about um, how can we bring this kind of liberal thinking to television, especially in the 60s, where it's a very conservative uh, TV landscape. Um, a lot of escapist shows like I Dream of Genie, Lost in Space, Star Trek, right? Um, even Julia, these shows that kind of are meant to kind of escape reality or escape kind of the, the what's happening in the world. I mean, this is like, you know, rampant parts of the, you know, civil rights movement before and after um folks fighting for the rights on the streets you know um lgbtqia rights women's rights everything so for them they wanted to contextualize how can we kind of bring this interesting political moment to comedy and how can we do that also where we have so much of our audience base is folks who are you know a conservative spot so really um all in the family their creation of that show you know which is a kind of a, a recreation of a british show bringing that to the U S was important because it was a connection of like a conservative base with like Archie Bunker as the father and his, and his kids as a liberal base. And really it's about how did these two uh, collide in this early 1970s moment? Right. Uh, what are the arguments about um, what are the racial epithets that are thrown around? How do they view society? So it really was this, the show was so popular because it got both audiences, the conservative base and this liber new liberal base in conversation. Right, it brought these two together. Um, and when they realized that that impact that show that had, and you know, in this new moment where them as independent producers, they can get paid through different networks, they realized, all right, we can actually do another show like this somewhere else because All in the Family is on top of the rating charts everywhere. So we're already doing this liberal show about this kind of working class white community. Let's try to do a show about a black community. But the show actually came from, um, talking, talking about Sanford and Son, came from uh, a British show called Steptoe and Son. And Steptoe and Son was about two uh, white uh, British men who run a junkyard in kind of very similar fashion to Sanford and Son. But then they realized that um, they can kind of use this and make a black version of it. So it wasn't necessarily they were trying to, you know, um, equalize TV and race, et cetera. They realized they have an audience base that would one, um, they already have an audience based off of uh, on the family viewership. It's going to watch regardless. But also there is a growing, you know, liberal minded post civil rights movement, black audience that wants to see themselves on TV more as well. So how can we marry the two? Let's create a TV show that kind of does somewhat similar things, but from a black perspective. And so they're able to lean into that. And then once they realize that the base of it is comedy, that's going to bring everyone there. But the blackness is going to be in your black audience as well. That's when they realize that they had something there and they can kind of continue to develop on this black audience that's liberal minded and interested in, you know, seeing themselves on screen. So really it was understanding the, the network politics of the moment. And I think that happens in every TV moment. I teach about history of TV. We see it in the 90s. It happened so big. So many black sitcoms because Fox is brand new. They want to be a different network than everybody else. But also the 80s was so conservative, mainly with this Cosby era, the 90s, like, all right, how can we now change that up? Because people are tired of that now. So it's all about the flows and trends of what people are interested in and watching on TV. And normally in Bud York and probably the first example of what a showrunner is, is definitely them. And they noticed that very early on. There's just so much that's going on in my head because the book takes a lot of um, turns when you're reading it because you think of what where you were when you read some of these yeah. and watched some of these things happening. And especially if you're older than I am or older than us, you're probably thinking of the outside noise. It's also still around. Yeah. You know, the reality on the ground and these shows mm -hmm. are kind of, you know, you're in your living room. This is your time to relax. And you're watching a show that's kind of reflecting these realities to a certain degree 
that weren't really there before because, like you said, Leave the Beaver, these shows had very different yeah. representations. These were more or less the post-World War II, yep. uh, the nuclear white family structure. Mm -hmm. And then you have here, like, some of the first instances of Black families on television, albeit a little bit stereotyped, but a lot more realistic than their predecessors. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and like, yeah, you said, like, Leave it to Be There, Father Knows Best, all these shows that kind of were on this, this idea of, like, a what they called the kind of golden era of television. Sorry, this is more so the classical era of television. It really was this idea of um, creating an America that we wanted everyone to align with, right? Because TV in general has always been about producing a vision of America that they want us as viewers to watch and align with, uh, consume, giving sponsorships you know, and advertising, but also uh, what we model to the world outside of America. And so for shows like that, this kind of nuclear white families, white picket fence, suburb, suburban families, that was the impetus of what America looks like to folks, right? The, but in reality came across when folks were, you know, a lot of the uprisings across the U.S. happened during the civil rights movement. A lot of it came down to the fact that, like, seeing themselves on screen, Black folks and people of color not seeing themselves truly represented was a part of this uprisings and part of the anger that ensued. And it's not a real America that doesn't show, if it doesn't show that. So even in All in the Family, although it is about a white family primarily, their next door neighbors are the Jeffersons. And that's how Jefferson's kind of spun off as well, too. So this idea of like in, 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 in like, you know, bringing in black and white communities who live next door to one another. Right. Um, and kind of infusing this idea of black communities and white communities together that happened in the late 60s, like looking at shows like Julia. But it started to be re realized that all right, we have to kind of we can't ignore the reality that, you know, um, there are mixed communities. Other folks of other cultures have stories to tell as well. So, yeah, that. Um, pressures from uh societal societal pressures coming from civil rights movement or other kind of uh, forces really pushed this idea that all right we have to use television uh more responsibly and showing these kind of fantastic or escapist shows they call them like fantastic family shows uh doesn't do us justice to defining kind of what america actually looks like and i remember when i was a kid watching sesame street and sesame yeah. street did this too a lot mm -hmm. you would see the pan out and it's like they actually taking like pictures of the projects. People are doing interviews in the projects. And I know people are seeing that they don't say anything explicitly, but you're watching it and you get your own messaging. Yeah. When you're watching the, the screen. You you see that and it affects people differently. And especially if you're black, you see that and you don't see that before. You never seen that kind of an image mm -hmm. before. Like, wow, that's where I live. Yeah. And Stephanie Sesame is a great example of that. And, and that show in and of itself was created as a way to kind of, um, well, as a public broadcast show, like that was the show that, you know, um, on PBS or early version of PBS where networks were required to show some of these shows because they had to infuse entertainment television with education. And so legally they actually had to uh, do that. I believe it's um, the, the act, the communications act escaped me right now, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a public broadcast act um, that was meant to legalize the idea that you have to put public broadcast, local broadcast on TV, kind of um, early prime time before these big box entertainment shows because we're not doing enough to educate the masses about the realities of, of America. So show like Sesame Street being shot, you know, black and brown people in the hood about education um, was hugely important to like this, realizing this idea that, okay, we have a huge base of folks who doesn't see themselves at all on TV and we need to service that base. So I think that's definitely what influence folks like Lear and others to dive deep into that um, the audience space that, that, that was largely ignored. Are you referring to the fine sign? Oh, fine sign. No, that's part of it too. So fine sign is a huge part of it. The financial and syndication act that what that did was um, kind of the, uh, you know, uh, that actually was what allowed the independent producers like Lear and Yorkin to um, make more money um, on what they sent to, to networks versus the networks having all money and all control over the show. So before that, the networks like ABC, CBS, and NBC, they controlled all TV production. Um, but the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, um, the government arm of kind of TV, they said, uh, you're making too much money and you're monopolizing the entire landscape of what TV is. So in order for us to slow you down, and slow down the, inter the vertical integration of like y'all making too much money. Let's go ahead and give um, 
independent producers a chance to work for different networks. So Lear and Yorkin, they had shows on NBC and CBS. They're making money for both. And beforehand, CBS and NBC would own 100% of those shows. Um, but FCC said, look, you can employ folks, but you can't be in charge of production, distribution, and exhibition. So um, that way, that's how Mary Tyler Moore from MTM and Norman Lear and Bud Yorkin from Tandem were able to you know, garner such um, – at the time period because they realized that they had to take advantage of a fine sign and the fact that fine signs giving folks access to be able to do this. But I was talking about actually the um, public broadcasting act of 1967. That was how PBS was developed. And that was like, you know, making folks aware that you had to networks had to add at least an hour or two of local programming um, to their standard lineup. And that gave money and eyes to the local networks as well. But, and I've, you know, I've thrown a lot of acronyms out there and a lot of acts. So that's the thing about people who are not studying TV, you know, notice all the politics in it too. Cause also with that, you have the primetime access rule. That's the thing that said if primetime is maybe 7 p.m. to 11 p.m., and primetime is like the time where networks want to have their best shows on TV, even to this day, because that's when they'll have the most audience. People are off work out of school, prime time is the best time to have your, your popular shows. So the prime time access rule, which was kind of around the same time as Fine Sign, around 70, 1970, uh, 1970 actually, that said that um, take your seven, eight hour, that was usually just for your network big shows, and now that has to be for local TV programming, like a PBS, like a Sesame Street, um, because, like a Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, for instance, because we need to give one credence and, and respect to the local programming, make sure that they, they have access to the audience base that you all take advantage of, but also it's to limit the power that the networks have. They were making too much money. And, and honestly, as you know, having that much power over the, the media and TV is a huge political power. You see now with presidential elections, if you control what people see, you control the fate of a lot of their lives. So giving TV networks too much power was a problem. So this was the way government kind of took some of that power back through these different laws and rules. And there's a lot more that I want to comment about mm -hmm. that later on. But mm -hmm. for right now, I'm curious about your favorite shows or whatever. So out of the 10 of production shows, do you have a favorite? Yeah, it's definitely, I, I hate saying this, especially when I was writing the book, but it's definitely Sanford and Son. Um, <laughs> because that's the one that my dad, my dad's from Trinidad and Tobago. And I kind of have a little um, story about that in the intro of the book where he him before coming to America, you know, um, he kind of watched American TV to learn what it's like to kind of be American. Right. Um, and Sanford and Son was one of those shows that he, that he uh, watched. And for him, it was a way of learning about black comedy, learning about, you know, black communities and growing up he had the same time DVDs for me. And I watched those a lot growing up before I even knew what tandem was or, you know, good times or Jefferson's. So for me, this is a funny show, but then I got older and realized like, Oh, there are a lot of like nuggets about talks a lot about Nixon talks a lot about poverty talks a lot about welfare. You know, I didn't know what those things meant. And then they made me kind of want to dive deeper into like understanding like, Oh, he's commenting on the black experience in this moment. What other shows are doing that? And that kind of was my gateway into the seventies moment. And then like, Oh, there's so much more history. Oh, two white men created this. You know, it added like layers I wanted to uncover. So definitely Sanford and Son is the one that brought me into that. And, and honestly, it's just it's undeniably funny still to this day. So that's one of, that's definitely my favorite show of that era. If not all black sitcoms for sure. Now I know you did a deep analysis and case study of the three Especially, you did Stanford and Son, you did Good Times, and you did the Jeffersons. Yes. Now, do you see the comedic value weight the same throughout those three tandem productions? Mm. Or do you think that they were all distinct shows in a certain way? Yeah. But to me, I have, when I was watching it, they're a little bit different. The format is, do, do you see that or do you just kind of see it as all the same do you see one is more comedic than the other yeah they're all different and i think I, I i have them in that order so like it's funny when i was writing the book one of my possible uh publicate uh publications i was going to work with i didn't work up not working with them but um they wanted to be based around like the book to be based around themes and things that all shows come together and for me that made it kind of too complicated for me i thought it was important to make it a 
a linear thing, like a narrative, like Sanford and Son first, then Good Times, then Jefferson's, and then the ending about how like different strokes came about and then how the how Tandem ended. To me, it was important to have this this like timeline chronologically because the shows changed because of the society was changing because of what expectations of audiences changed. So definitely Sanford and Son is definitely, I would say, the most comedic, particularly because Red Fox is a stand-up comedian. You know, like a lot of they didn't know what they were doing. A lot of a lot of the things were imp improvisation. Red Fox is the one that pushed for them to actually have a black writer on the show for the first time. Um, there's all white writers for the first season. Red Fox said, look, you're not writing for me and our people. So have this writer on the show. Red Fox was the first one to say, hey, if you don't do this, I'm going to walk off the show. Walk off. They paid him and then came back. You know, So he was the first one to show how, how powerful a black artist can be in a, a place that, that didn't want them there in the first place. So undeniably more funny. And I think that also that show is probably the one that oftentimes in Tandem's history isn't talked about alongside Tandem because even like looking at Norman Lear's autobiography, et cetera, he doesn't really talk about it much because Bud Yorkin mainly worked on that show while Norman Lear was still working on All in the Family and Good Times. Those were like his babies and Jefferson's really. So Sanford and Son often gets pushed away from their history. Um, but funny enough, Sanford and Son had like the high, other than uh, All in the Family, Sanford and Son had the high, highest rankings too. But that show was pushed away largely because a lot of folks kind of simply see that as, as purely comedic. That's one of the reasons I want to write this book is that this book, this show has so much more than just the comedy. Um, the comedy alone was enough, but a lot of deep conversations. And I think that it gets masked in how funny he is, but it's so much real stuff he's talking about. Whereas, you know, Good Times, they're thriving off the idea of the first black nuclear family, right? And that is what it is like this idea of a family, what family looks like and how families make it through hard times together. So Good Times actually is probably the prototypical sitcom, um, at home sitcom, you know, uh, in general, but obviously they add poverty and blackness to it. But the whole model of the sitcom aligns with that, like you think of Father Knows Best, you mentioned Leave the Beaver, all those family sitcoms, that's kind of what Good Times aligns with. Of course, when you add the black talk and everything makes it much different. And the Jeffersons was um, normally anybody Yorkin's response to folks saying, we're tired of seeing black folks just be poor, right? Or working class. So that was like the black success story. But still, it's still like a black folks in the space of white folks and not being comfortable is the whole kind of premise of that comedy. So yeah, you see the trajectory changes of like, all right, pure comedy. Here's the family aspect y'all are asking for. All right, here's the money y'all are asking for. They're all very black in what they're doing, but they all show, a, a, I call it a narrative arc of kind of how blackness is developed. And without Jefferson's, we don't see a different strokes. We don't see a Benson. We don't see Cosby show because like that made it clear that black folks having financial ascension is possible on TV and, and can like be, you know, um, realized and believable. And how do you compare those shows to some of the productions? Like, I remember when I was going up 227. Yeah. Um, Amen. Yeah. I think he came on NBC. And then, like you alluded to earlier, you had the, the 90s Fox shows. And then after that, you had the Steve Harvey show and all these, the Dwayne his brothers. Everyone mm -hmm. had a show, it seemed like. And then you had a different world. Yeah. I believe it was in the 80s too, the late 80s. Late 80s, yeah. So, so, how do you compare? Is it pretty much just continuum, in your opinion, of those shows? Or did they have completely different formats in themselves? Yeah, it's, it, it's both. It's a continuum based on the fact that, you know, the 70s proves that blackness can sell, right? That was the whole fear beforehand in the 60s, right? You don't have any, the 60s, you don't have any shows that are primarily black cast. You have a show like, you have Julia, you know, she's a star, but she, the cast is, she's only she, her and her son are black, right? You have I Spy, it's not a comedy, but it's a, you know, kind of buddy cop thing, you know, with, with uh, Bill Cosby and, um, uh, where he kind of rose to his fame, but really you don't have any, and you also have like, you know, um, Mod Squad, right? We have like kind of mm -hmm. one black character per all these popular black shows, all these popular shows. And it's hard to even define them as black shows, right? I definitely call Julia a black sitcom, particularly only because the power that Diane Carroll ended up gaining on the show later on in the season, but as in its roots, how Cantor, the producer, says it's supposed to be an escapist show. It's not supposed to address what's happening in the world. We want this to be a show that people forget about the world in real life. Mind you, this is 1968. You know, 
King was assassinated, or uh, like war times happening, all, all these things happening in 68, you know, Vietnam, all, all these things are happening, but the show is as if that none of that exists. That was the point of that, right? But the 70s is really what they call the era of social relevance. It's really where things came to bear, where we're talking about all this stuff. The comedy is what makes it, it brings levity to it, but that's when the reality came about. But it's funny you mentioned 227 and Amen. The stars of those shows came from the Jeffersons. They mm -hmm. came from, you know what I mean? So it's like, it is a continuum in a lot of ways. And after the 70s proved that blackness can sell, the 80s continued that trend, you know what I mean? In different ways. You saw Benson, you saw, uh, you know, Give Me a Break with Nell Carter. Um, you mentioned Amen. You mentioned, um, you know, 227. All these shows of the 80s. And you get into Cosby Show. You get into, you know, Frank's Place. All of these mm -hmm. different things come about as blackness sells. And we know it because the 70s was full of it. But how can we are right, how, how can we sell it in different ways? How can we sell it in more the 80s is about kind of like conservative Reaganism? So how can we sell it in more middle class conservative ways? Uh, and then the 90s comes and Fox actually gives black people production power. That's the difference between 70s and 80s. Black folks weren't in any power. They were the actors, the some were writers. But none of them were producers, no executive producers. Fox came and they realized, all right, ABC, CBS, and NBC have been running TV since the 50s. This is now late 80s, early 90s. What can we do as Fox to bring audiences to our new network? Part of it was let's cater to, you know, black and brown young audiences, black, brown, and youth. Because mm -hmm. uh, the hip hop era is bringing a whole new peop er uh, audience of folks who buy new things. ABC, CBS, and NBC, they don't need that. They have legacy. They don't need this new audience. So Fox says, okay, let's, let us do that. Let's get the youth, the black and brown folks, and let's give them production power. So Keen Avery Waynes, you're a producer now. Here comes Living Color. Mm -hmm. right? Mar Martin Lawrence, here comes Martin. Um, you know, Charles Sutton, or Dutton, excuse me, here comes Rock. Um, and you have like Yvette Lee Bowser on Living Color, et cetera. So Fox gave black folks actual power to create. So that's why Fox changed things. But in general, the continuum started in the in the 70s when they realized that blackness can sell. So we can't ignore blackness anymore, but how are we gonna allow them to sell is what the thing was. And I think 80s, Cosby ran all of that, you know, all of Cosby show in a different world. And, you know, talking about him is difficult, obviously, um, but you can't deny the impact on TV for sure. Um, regardless of the, the, the egregious and terrible things he's done, the, the, how we impact television you can't talk about tv history without it unfortunately but he had all the power in the 80s so when it came to the 90s it was about how can we broad spectrum this people were tired of the 80s cosby lifestyle that kind of really denigrated anything that wasn't you know um an ideal form of like you know perfection or respectability so the 90s is about talking against all that and let's give black folks the power to create some new things because that's the way that fox was able to make something different from everybody else. Yeah. I, I think in the 80s, too, there was a huge transition um, to where younger people were the protagonists because yeah, even going into the 90s, because I remember A Different World, mm -hmm. and that was a show that was Changed the very game. much like cutting yeah. edge to me. Mm -hmm. And then before you know it, you have Saved by the Bell. Yeah. And I like both of those shows, but there's a youth emphasis. Even the Wonder Years, you had yeah. the, the voiceover. And then you have, um, there's, there was, I felt like a lot of shows like Punky Brewster. Yeah. Like there were so many like shows that were shows, yeah. based around kids back then mm -hmm. in that time period. Yeah. It was because also like, yeah, the trend always was big families or like the father main character or whatever. Right. So like you have a youth audience now and like they started actually caring about folks who were going to college and realizing that black folks were going to college, especially in the early eighties and the mid eighties. So like a different world was perfect in that aspect because also, you know, these Cosby kids are growing up, you know, the first, it is a spinoff of the Cosby show where, you know, I believe Denise goes to college and that's she's just in season one. It doesn't really work out. They bring in, you know, Debbie Allen to come produce. And now then the shows that hit people, when people talk about, different world of talking about seasons two through six mm -hmm. right yeah. and the fact that the you know she made sure the show was more black it was at a historically black college university that's when actually the cosby stuff kind of got pushed out yeah he's the creator he's he created it but like the show got better when they pushed all these things out where it's about like respectability and all that and talk, talking about real stuff like you know um colorism you know uh, uh date rape you know abortion uh 
being in college, love life, sex life, all these things are so real to a scar experience. I know folks that, you know, older than myself that like didn't know what HBCUs, HBCUs were until different world, just decided to go to one because of that show. Right. So I think that's, in my opinion, that's my, the best of Cosby's creations because it is so much of not his influence on it is where it got better. This idea of like creating this idea, getting away from this idea of what perfection looked like and being tapping into the reality of black college life or black, you know, teen, late teen, early 20, 20 something's lifestyle because finding themselves and growing through that space and getting out of the home as far as the sitcom too. So many sitcoms were just based in the home getting out of sitcom um, to in college and, and may realize, okay, cool. We can, we can get away from this kind of simply in-home sitcom dynamic. And I think that that moment of different worlds really changed the game in that aspect for sure. And it led to the nineties realizing what they could do. We talk about a ton of issues on this show. It I'd say it's about 75 political, 25 cultural and everything else that mm -hmm. complete randomness at times, but nothing's <laughs> completely random. It all kind of makes sense if Absolutely. people follow the show. But I was thinking about just these buzzwords. Like I know for like three years there, the politicians are throwing around the CRT, the critical race theory, the intersectionality. And it's just funny being in academia, how it's, I was in a Spanish program and we didn't even use the terminology. Right. <laughs> We know, I mean, we use intersectionality, but it wasn't like the way they were using it. Like everything was just, and I'm saying to myself, the whole time we we lived intersectionality, just the one example I really got from that, and that came to my head back and forth when I was reading this book is when you mentioned Steptoe and Son, because yeah. I knew that San Francisco was based on Steptoe and Son, a Brit sitcom. Mm -hmm. But if you watch the two shows together, they're nothing alike, really. Mm -hmm. it, it just proves intersectionality exists. Mm -hmm. Because you can take a similar or adjacent situation and it completely changes based on who you are. I mean, yeah. it, it couldn't be any different. But Absolutely. to me, that kind of proves the point of intersectional dynamics. Right. And that, like, yeah, someone's experiences and who they, what they look like and how the society views them completely changes their outcome. Like, yeah, you can place two people, myself as a black man with a white man in one location, having the same education or whatever, like we go to the same college. Our experience is going to be different no matter no matter what you like there is no way because of how america was built how society looks how people assume how we all have these microaggressions around racism myself and the other person probably as well around race around religion um social economic background all that so yeah you have to understand you have to acknowledge these these, these intersections that make somebody who they are differently yeah we both made it to this college but in what ways did we make it and i think mm -hmm. that's so important too like you mentioned Septo and Son, um, the entire first season of Sanford and Son uh, is literally, if, if you watch back, go back to the credits, you can say based off of, it says based off of the ep this episode of, Sep of Septo and Son. So pretty much every episode of the first 12 episodes of, of season one, every episode is simply a Septo and Son episode, but with Red Fox and, and, and Damon Wilson. Mm -hmm. But watch them back to back, they look completely different because of we're in Watts, California, two black men working at a junkyard versus living, I forgot what part of uh, Britain they live in, but it's like it's very low income area of Britain. How they talk, how they act, like how they perform, how they interact with one another is completely different. Mm -hmm. And the cultures are different, you know, the, it's a different country. So, like, you cannot say that it, even though the scripts are exactly the same, how they performed, how they orate, totally different. So, yeah, the experience of who you are and your background no matter the same location we're at now, you got to have to consider the intersections that, that brought you to where you are now. A hundred percent. And I'll be honest with you. That was my least favorite season. The San Francisco was the first one. Uh, yeah. Same, same. <laughs> it's like, so like I, I have, I have talked about it. So, yeah. other stuff is like, you almost forget it. Yeah. And the first season is kind of like where for them, obviously it's like, um, will the show sell? You know what I mean? Like they have to, they're out there and like they, they didn't take any risks because they were afraid. So like really for them, let's do some established scripts already and see how they work. Folks liked it well enough, but even Red Fox was like second season. That's why they hired Alunga Adele, the first black staff uh, writer in, in television. Um, Cause he said, I need someone who's going to be able to articulate being black in Watts in 1972, you know, and these white writers can't do that. And some rewrites of a British show can't do that either. So 
that was the impetus of like, you know, um, we see the second season is when the was when the rate second and third season are the highest rated ones. And that's mm-hmm. when more black writers came in. Red uh Richard Pryor and Paul Mooney came in to write for the show as well. You know, what I mean, you have these established folks in comedy who were writing for this show, it's because they realized that all right, people that need to reflect on that are, are the emphasis of the show, and that's what made the show skyrocket. And that's when Red Fox, you actually saw him being more of himself too. Yeah, because the first season it's it's funny, funny poems, but it's very dry in a lot of the humor. And it's because mm-hmm. there is no, they're not, it's not written for them. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And I had to bring this up because I think you alluded to the fact your dad is from Trinidad. Yes. And I thought it was an interesting analysis when you talked about Sanford and son, you talked about this motif of uh, Fred Sanford, his real name obviously is Red Fox. He's the trickster. Yes. He used that, um, this kind of a archetype, mm-hmm. but I thought it was interesting that you alluded to Anansi, the spider. Mm-hmm. And um, is that from your Trinidadian background? Is that where that's from? Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the reasons. Like, kind of, was that kind of in the back of your head? Yeah, a little bit because it was about this idea of how um, the black diaspora in general traditions of like performance exist through like histories of Africa brought to Caribbean, brought to the U S right brought to the States. So yeah, the, it came to be like an understanding of like, when we think of histories of black comedy, they come from, you know, Africa and they come from, you know, the spread of the diaspora. So the Anansi, the spider and the trickster is something that has always been a part of black comedy in some ways, a black performance. I can go back and like, you know, and talking about plays in the past as well too. It is part of this black um, community performance of like, you know, um, this person is trying to always trick their way into something better, but they always fall short. It's kind of like, and that's the route of a lot of black comedies. Like they're always trying to find a, a get rich quick scheme or a way out. And then by the end, they fail in some way comedically and they're back where they're back where they're supposed to be, or we're supposed to be like as in like society places them there. Same thing happens though. I mentioned too, in like shows like, um, what show did I use? Um, the Honeymooners, right? Mm-hmm. Ralph, Ralph Cramden and them. And it's just like, and Ed Norton, like the whole thing is about them trying to get rich quick all the time. However, we simply solely look at the comedy of that, but they're never called tricksters. They're never called hustlers, none of that. But when we think about blackness, we think about Amos and Andy, stuff like that, they're called tricksters. They're called hustlers. They're called schemers. And there's a racial, uh, which is why hustle economics, the term I, I mentioned in the title of the book, it exists because there's a particular way that blackness and economics and blackness and scheming and blackness and trying to make it is demonized than whiteness white shows aren't they're doing the exact same thing you know lying and scheming to make a quick buck or do something however when it comes to blackness it's like you're laughing at the calamity and the um the uh, uh, uh extra legal things that red fox does or Fred sanford does but it's not called the same it's just like hijinks when you look at these white shows right so for me it was so important to go to the root of like what folks understood as black comedy and black performance through like a Nazi, the spider and the trickster to help understand how Red Fox uh, as Fred Sanford aligns with that and why so many black audiences are able to connect with that because history shows like that's the comedy that kind of we, we get, we get this idea of like trying to make out, trying to get out of there, but society keeps us in one place. And we get the fact that we're always usually the smaller person having to go against the bigger person. And um, how do we, you know, find ways to scheme around that, right? How do we find ways to, you know, um, stick it to the man, so to speak? And mm-hmm. that's just a whole history of like how we have, as, as people have uh, understood the world. So that comedy that aligns with that is so important, I think. Okay, so I, this is more of a philosophical question. Yeah. Because I've obviously read the book and some of the people in my audience may not have read it, but mm-hmm. I recommend people get this book scratching and surviving i'm going to put the information episode description and um in case you want to contact uh, dr sebro after the show we can discuss that. it towards the end but again the subtitle of this is hustle economics and the black sitcoms with tandem productions so as far as this philosophical angle i was thinking are these shows a concession to okay we're not going to give you anything beyond this this is what you're going to get in terms of the result of the civil rights movement Mm. because there's definitely a case to be made that these shows in ways tamed Mm -hmm. people's lived experiences to the point where, okay, this is going to be the apex of what black people are going to get. 
Yeah. Um, we're not going to see any more revolutionary activity outside mm-hmm. of this. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you, where do you stand when it comes to that? I know you brought it up some in the book. Yeah, there's this important document called the Kerner Commission Report. Uh, it was put together in 1967 and 68. Um, it was in response to Lyndon Johnson when it was in response to um, uprisings happening across the across America. I um, mean, in, in all the kind of big black metropolitan state like, you know, Newark, New Jersey, New York, uh, Detroit, um, Watts in 68, Chicago. Um, and it was Lyndon Johnson created, convened a group of 12 folks, like uh, mostly politicians throughout the U.S., only two black people. But um, to say kind of what, what can we do to stop to stop these uprisings? Well, they call them riots. I call them uprisings and rebellions. Um and what they did was a year long study of going to these neighborhoods and talking to people like, what is it you need from American government to like to, to no longer want to uprise, right? Came down to, you know, uh, more jobs, more hospitals near them, um, you know, after school activities for their children, you know, better schooling, all these things are important. But another thing was how we look in the media was a huge part of why black folks are uprising because the black folks are looked at as like, especially in the 60s, you're looked at in the news as, you know, the violence, the ghetto is, is in of black communities, all that. But what about what's happening in our communities that, you know, um, unless ain't positive or negative, but what's happening in our communities that are like, you know, it's constructive, you know, how are we dealing with this? And also, why aren't you t- hearing about it from us, right? So that there was this complete call for more um, existence of blackness. It's, it's an, the article says Negroes, but that's the time, the uh, verbiage in that moment. There's a call for more um, blackness on TV in the news, in news reporting, um, in dramas, and in sitcoms. It literally says this in the documentation that folks have talked about this in the research they did. So in 68, you had um, this influx of shows um, on local programming. You had, um, you've ever heard of Say Brother? Um, You've ever heard of, um, there's a great book called Black Power TV. It talks about these public affairs shows. But um, Inside Bedford Stuyvesant, um, Black Journal, Soul, right? All these public access. Mm -hmm. TV shows by and for black people, like ran by, produced by for black communities, but they're local shows, right? They're funded through like um, through uh, different national funding programs, so, so people could like you know run these shows about what it's like to be black in Boston and Chicago and New York and San Francisco. I wrote an article about one called "Black Blues Black," uh, hosted by Maya Angelou, actually in San Francisco as well too. So all these various shows about what is li- black, like living like a black person in these areas. Amazing things, right? But this is their local programming. They're not prime time, everyone in the world watches type shows. So then you started to get, you know, Julia. That was kind of a hint of, all right, we'll give you something black. It wasn't until these shows that we saw the blackness really come come to fold in prime time into all the public, not just local programming. And yeah, you're right. It is a concession in a lot of ways because... It's network TV, so you can't get as deep as you want to. You can't say it as much as you want to. You can't, you know, perform what you want to do. You still have to be universal in some aspects because of advertisers and people who pay for it. But a lot of the coding and, and conversation um, through the comedy, a lot of folks don't get. A lot of it's very, very up in your face. A lot of it's very kind of you have to dig through the weeds. So, yeah, I would say in a lot of ways it's a concession. But then you look at what's happening in the film in this moment, you have black quotation. So that's mm-hmm. is the black response to all this, right? The completely black response of, um, and a very strong black response against the man, against whiteness, uh, talking about sexuality and freedom, et cetera, and uh, uh, drug running, hustling, all that, but about black working class life, which is so important, but obviously that can't be shown on TV. So it's about like, you have to go, you get different types of blackness when you go watch, uh, you know, um, not Cotton, well, Cotton Comes to Harlem, you go watch Superfly, you know, you go watch um, any of these other black films that are so important to our culture, but you watch them coupled with Sanford and Son on TV, you know, you get a good balance of both. So I think that it took searching for blackness in different medias to have an idea of like kind of seeing ourselves in various ways, like local media, um, um, national network media and through black quotation of films. But uh, yeah, TV can only do so much. So I think that within the bounds of what they were allowed to able to do, it was great for what it did, but also, you know, with the white executive control, you still didn't see kind of the, the complete effort of what blackness on TV can look like. You kind of didn't really see that into the 90s. And 
So my question, we're in 2024 now. Obviously, time's different. Yeah. But and I know we have Netflix, Hulu, we have Roku, we have all these different mediums. But why come we don't have has the sitcom format changed? Because why come there are no shows now that are really duplicable to those shows back then? Yeah. Even in terms of like, man, they talked about real shit back then. It's like yeah. now you don't really see that. Like, is there a reason for that? Yeah. Uh the way you said yes, the sitcom has changed in a lot of ways. Um, and audience expectations have changed a lot too. Uh, because it's all about now kind of um keeping one's attention now is why we have so many it's it's really you mentioned all these streaming services you didn't even mention not only you even mentioned netflix if you, if you did it yeah but you have hulu paramount plus peacock it's too much right so <laughs> it really is about what's going to hold your attention and i think that um also folks are so just now in like you know camera working angles so like you know you see like a, a blackish it's very shot like like a film you know it's one camera you know, it's not like a a, a fixed set with three cameras, like the traditional sitcom, really. Um, Abbott Elementary is probably the biggest one right now that, yeah. you know, thankfully is doing great work, talking great conversations in a lot of ways is universal in some ways because folks understand like, you know, what it's like going to public school. Not everyone understands, of course, but like it's a, it's a universally understood thing, but there's a lot of blackness added to it with the Philly slang, the discussions, how they bring in, you know, um, language of the, of the contemporary. So, that shows doing a lot of the great work, but yeah, the format of it still is very kind of filmic, filmic in a lot of ways, how the camera follows you. And there are some traditional sitcoms on television as well. Um, the, the last one that was kind of a black traditional sitcom, I would say, uh, and traditional, I mean, like the thick set three cameras, was probably like the, the Gerard Carmichael show, which is great, you know, um, oh, great yeah, sitcom right. on ABC, uh, David Allen Greer played his father, um, and uh her name escaped me right now, but like very popular cast in that show. But what happened with that show was that great three great seasons, not talk about enough, honestly. And it took a different look. It's like it's, it was about being black and living in this North Carolina, like living in the South. Loretta, Loretta Devine is his mother. The name came to me right now. So star-studded cast, extremely funny, had a different take on blackness. I think the dad was a Trump support, right? It was like it was funny in a lot of aspects of it too, like looking at blackness from the perspective of like living in the South. Mm -hmm. where we don't really see on sitcoms but he wanted to do a little bit more in the show as far as pushing it i think there was an episode regarding like a you know a, a, a mall shooting that they shelled for a second and he thought it was important to see you know a mass shooting obviously a mass shooting happened recently when, when the episode's gonna come out so it was about like you know still the idea that executive power can still shelve things for when they want to is what made him ultimately like kind of leave leave writing the show gerard carmichael that is so there's Again, there are shows that show it that, that that are important to the sitcom space right now. Um, but it still comes down to who has the power in um creating it. In a lot of ways, we see over time the Wayne's family left a living color because they want in Living Color wanted to change things. Uh the executives at Fox. Um, you know, uh Martin, not Martin, excuse me. Um, who else wanted to change? I mean, it happens, it's happened every every decade, right? Uh, Dave Chappelle, excuse me, he left a star, an extremely big contract because they wanted to change the root of his shows. Right? It happens every, it happens over time, and right, and that's the kind of way they kind of push in and bring someone else to come in. They push Dave Chappelle out, they brought in Key and Peele. You know what I mean? They they find mm -hmm. someone who's willing to make concessions, and the shows that are so important to our history that took that that leap to talk about something real um, often get canceled because like, you know, the network started to feel like they're, they're doing too much or it's taken away from the universalness of it rather than, you know, they're trying to make it more direct talking about blackness and real issues. So I would say like shows are kind of able to do a bit more now when you go on to like the, uh, um, network TV, you still have to follow a lot of rules. I like to show the upshaws on, um, Netflix with mm -hmm. Mike Epps and, uh, you know, uh, Wanda Sykes and, you know, um, that show is important, I think, um, Kim and Kim Fields, because it's on Netflix. You don't have to face the same, like, you know, content and language and, like, you know, standards and practices as you do on network TV. And it's, it's a traditional sitcom. You know, they cuss. They say a lot of wild stuff. <laughs> and it's naturally funny. And I think it's a good look on, you know, as what sitcoms can be if you follow a certain format. Um, so for me, there, there are ways to do that now in this moment. I think they're a good example of it. Um, but the few and far between because folks now are realizing like, you know, the reality, the ra reality TV show market is so big 
because it's so cheap and easy to make. Um, and you don't need writing for it. You know what I mean, too? Um, so a lot of folks right now in the executive space are looking for what's easy to be cheaply made and folks are still going to watch it. So a lot of that has to come with like the reality TV and the dramas versus sitcoms. You got to have a, a a point. You got to have a dedicated audience. Like Abbott Elementary, you get the teachers, you get the lower income folks, you get the black folks, you get folks from Philly. You get so many different pockets of audiences that are going to watch it. And then you get folks who just like comedy. Simple as that. And these other shows, you need a more of a hook. And I would say and right now, executives want the shows that you don't need a hook. We got Love is Blind part eight now. We don't need mm -hmm. a hook. It's just messy and easy to write. So boom, audience. Audiences are like stuff that you don't have to think about sometimes too. So audience expectations as well as what executives want to pay for changes what we're looking at now on TV. But I think you make the point too with the Netflix format. Yeah. You could, in theory, because, I mean, temporality is going to change things, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. But you still have the explicit language and everything else. You can pretty much say what you want on those types of mediums. But it'd be hard to imagine a show like Sanford and Son on network television, like now, like prime time. Oh, absolutely network not. Television. It wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. I, yeah. <laughs> I think what was the one where um, he's, you alluded to, is like one of the first um, episodes you analyzed where he's in the, the courthouse. Court, the black judge is there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then Skillet and Leroy and all the people are in the audience. And then he's finding like a traffic ticket or something. I yeah. Mean, <laughs> Like just some of those scenes are just like, man, they stick with you. <laughs> just yeah, like absolutely. And the, the the funny enough, the uh, I like that one because every sitcom up to the 90s has a like Amos and Andy has one. And I know it's because I watch too much TV because it's what I do. But Amos and Andy has a has a episode where they sold they stole a coin from a, a telephone uh, telephone uh, pole or booth. They go to a courthouse. Mind, it's 1951. They go to courthouse. It's a black judge giving them a sentence. Um, we see it happen in Sanford and Son. Black judge giving a sentence, and where he acts like Red Fox is a is a acts like he's a lawyer for his son Lamont, which, which brings all the comedy there. And we see it again in the '90s in Martin Show. He goes to court for a traffic ticket. There's a black woman judge, and he's representing himself. He's acting like, acting like a lawyer. So like there's like this trend of like blackness. And it's funny, funny enough, it's like yeah, it's comedy, but it's also like clearly about black folks in this and criminal justice system. You know what I mean? You got to think deeper than that. Like why is a courthouse scene and with the black judge is really meant to, meant, to, meant to show like that no matter what color the judge is, that's still like criminality. That's still like the judicial system and you're black. So you're still going to have to face that regardless. The fact that this shows in the fifties, the nineties, mm -hmm. it's much more than just comedy. Like this is all stuff that's repeated over time. And so like, yeah, it seemed like that it was extremely funny. And he says, like, you know, he, he talks, the whole crowd is black in the San Francisco episode. He says, like, oh, it's like a Tarzan movie, like, <laughs> you know, and that can never be said now. Right. But it's, it's, it's hilarious. But like in that moment, there were so many laws that weren't written yet about TV. So like uh, normally, normally, but York took full advantage of that. They said the N word about four, three, four times throughout the series. There were no rules against that. You know, um, there were no rules against certain things, epithets that they could say. And it was just like, all right, cool. And then I think mid 70s, late 80s, when they started kind of bringing more rules around that, but it was free for all. That's why Tandem Productions is so popular because mm -hmm. they took advantage of a moment that th nothing was written yet. The laws were actually written because of them in a lot of ways. So with that, that comedy could not exist now. No. Um, especially in a way that the um, networks, networks, uh, harness down on standards and practices whereas like you know comedy central Chappelle got away with, away with a lot because that's still cable so it's like you know you got to pay for that so it's still like not as bad as network as far as like restricting but he barely got away from that in cable so to think on network it would never happen i think people the thing we need to understand too about comedy is that there's a politics off screen as well as Absolutely. on screen yeah and i think in living color for instance mm -hmm. For me, is the closest thing to a Sanford and Son in a different type of format because um, I just heard some interviews with Keenan Ivory Wayne, and he was talking about how you don't know how much we fought with executives, man, to get some oh, yeah. stuff on TV. Mm -hmm. Like, because Living Color was like pretty cutting edge. Oh, it like, went there. It went there know? for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and Fox was cool with it. 
Fox was cool with it as much as they could be because, again, they want to compete with these old school folks. So they're like, look, all right, we'll see what happens. I feel like Fox was, I read this book, actually, you know, if we're talking about books, I wanted to talk about a book to help write mine. It's called Colored by Fox by Chris. Oh, Brent wow. Z. And it's about the Fox network and kind of how it revolutionized black TV. And talks about how, like, Fox was afraid every week coming out with In Living Color, like, oh, we're about to be canceled, right? Because it's like they were doing stuff that we'd never seen before. And, but the, but at the end of the day, the, the audience liked this so much. The ratings were so good. They got a lot of bad feedback, but their positive feedback was so much more important. So they got away with a lot of this stuff. And um, only for so long, they want to change some stuff up. That's when the Waynes left. And the show mm-hmm. kind of knows that after the third season, in my opinion. So really, yeah. it's like, yeah, the so much of this stuff is about risk. And like, all right, look, we'll see what happens. And in this case, it worked out for them. But a lot of folks now aren't willing to make those risks anymore. And now Fox, it's funny now, Fox is now such known for like its conservative and its far right leaning stuff that you wouldn't even realize that Fox was like the blackest network at one point. <laughs> but then you realize that I tell people all the time, like Fox wasn't doing this because they thought it was so important to see black people on screen. They wanted blackness. No, Fox was doing it because it was a business strategy. All TV is about what's going to make us money. Right now, the audience is about about 30% of our audience base who are buying things are are black. We we can can't ignore how big of an audience base that is. So let's cater to them. Let's make shows for them. But the moment that Fox got enough ratings and enough star power to buy out um Sunday football rights, all those games that happen on Sundays to this day on Fox, they got those rights in about 1994, I think. Once they got those rights, you saw all the black shows get canceled. Starts to disappear. So it was a matter of it was a strategy to make money and to make a name for themselves. It wasn't about loving blackness and black comedy. It was about let's, let's be different from everyone else. All right, cool. Now we're on par with everybody else. Now we can move away from that. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's something. I tell you just the trajectories of these yeah. um, shows and these networks and mm-hmm. you can see the production value changing at the you know at the split second. But I want to go back with the concluding moments of this conversation, I want to talk about just, um, I know for myself, Sanford and Son was always my favorite. And I think when I read the book, I was more enthusiastic in those. I was like, I want to really see where the analysis is going to be on here. And I really liked the way you um, talked about LaWanda Page. Oh, yeah. Place on Esther. Mm-hmm. Because it's just what your book uncovers is a lot of the struggle behind the scenes that people don't see with, um, not just the script writing, but just the fact that Red Fox was threatening, you know, I might leave if you don't bring in some of the people from the blue comedy circuit and the yeah. children's circuit. Yeah. You better bring these people in with me, you know, mm-hmm. so they can do that thing. And I like the part where I think you quoted Red Fox as saying, just be yourself. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. To Lawanda Page, yeah. It just... Yeah. Uh, that was cool to get that behind the scenes type analysis. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing too. That's why I heralded him so much. And you know, he he died broke because he gave so much to, to everybody else, honestly. Obviously, he lived a lavish lifestyle, but he's one of the people that like I think I mentioned in the book too. He would like, hey, can my friend come in and get like a, a guest spot for fifty for like fifty to hundred for five hundred dollars, fifty to five hundred dollars for like two minutes on set. He's that guy that brought his chilling, like, you know, chilling circuit folks um, from these all black spaces that only they were only allowed to perform in all black spaces. He brought them to network TV. He was a like, scat man Carruthers, for instance, like, you know, folks that, you know, black folks know, but white people are like, who the hell mm-hmm. is this? Right. So <laughs> he was that person. And he always put on for his people to a point that like it, it dis- disadvantaged him often. But I think that, you know, um, for me, it was about redeeming some of these folks in a lot of the light that that, that they were like shining upon because people know about them. They, they call him difficult. They call him, you know, disruptive, all that. Yeah, he may have been, but what he did for black people was hugely important. And the Wanda Page part was so important to me because I always loved the character and I always noticed some more depth to her. But when I started researching, I was like, oh, she has done it, right? And, and, and like, neither of them come from acting. So like, even from Luanda, none of them read scripts before. They go to stand up. They're from they're from poor backgrounds, like l- real poverty. Um, and she was a burlesque dancer. She was a snake dancer, fire breather. She did all types of things. She's loved entertainment. She stumbled into comedy, was great in it. And she funny you mentioned Skillet Leroy. She worked with them on comedy circuits as well too. Like this mm-hmm. whole there was a comedy community that they all knew each other from. And he brought that community. He said, "If I can make it 
uh, national primetime. Y'all, know, I'm no better than y'all. We're all from the same place. He brought them out too. And for her not being able to read scripts or anything like that, he helped her craft that. And she has mentioned how much she credits her, her success to him. And it's funny because like I thought it was so important because I was like, all right, she's so important to me because she's that kind of first black woman from stand up to go to a sitcom. Julia has a whole sitcom, but she wasn't a stand up comedian, nor were Louise Beavers in the past or none of them as well. Like she's the first stand up comedian to come to a sitcom and actually have a recur- recurring role. You know, we go to good times. None of them were stand-up comedians. Same in Jefferson's, right? So, well, sorry, Jimmy J. Walker was stand-up comedian, but none of the women were. So for her to be the first stand-up woman woman to, like, make a sitcom space for herself was huge. And um, to, to make that transition from stand-up, blue, like, blue, co- blue comedy stand-up, like the raunchy, dirty stuff, to this kind of holy roller was like, oh, she can do so much different things. And I just love that fact that she can kind of mirror her image in different ways, but also because it, it made clear that black women look so different than what we just are packaged um, in like Julia or, or in, in on Esther. Look at her standups. That's not the same on Esther at all. You're right. No. Um, <laughs> so that was so important to me to show that, that the kind of ambiguity of what black women could look like and they don't look just a certain way. And uh, funny enough, the next book I'm working on is about other is about Wanda Page um Shirley Hemphill and also you know um Marsha Warfield as black women in stand up who go to sitcoms and kind of what ensued wow. with that too. So yeah, I'm trying to like there's so much more to write about Luanda even after she left Sanford and Son, you know, she was promised a show, never came, was on was on a couple other shows and her comedy changed and shifted too, but in the 90s she had this resurgence on so many different sitcoms as well. So it was really about bringing her and these other women I mentioned into conversation about like um, a black community tradition that doesn't acknowledge them at all. Yeah. I also had to come in a little bit on the good times. Just yeah. when I was watching these shows to me, good times, I don't know how you felt about, it, but it was too serious for me to really laugh at yeah. a lot. Yeah. To, me, was, yeah. to me, good times had more of a serious tone yeah. to it. Cause I, mean, I was like, it's funny, but it's like, damn, this is like, this is reminding me of kind of like what I'm dealing with, you know. What no, I mean? yeah, same. Like I, I grew up, you know, in poverty as well. So like, you know, uh, it's funny watching Good Times. I think very much thought the same thing, and because a lot of it is just like, all right, this touches his home a little bit, you know, welfare, you know, making making ends meet, all that. And I think Good Times was more so about the universal comedy than it was necessarily like you know black comedy like we see in um, um, Sanford and Son, right? Comedy, whereas like you know, you kind of like you know from a black experience, black tradition. Good times was about all right. You have this black family dealing with dealing with extreme poverty issues. Who can laugh at this? Some we we may be laughing also, but folks of us who are experiencing it, we're not laughing as much as you know white folks who are like, oh, look at this black family, right? Oh, that's funny. Like not seeing that we don't see humor in that. We get how it's funny, but that's not really funny to us because we live that, right? Mm So it definitely was a more serious take on a, a family dynamic dealing with tough times but the comedy of it which is why it's always heralded even more so than Sanford and Son is a more universal comedy and they did more in, in terms of like shifting cultures having a black nuclear family was much more impactful to what TV is as a whole and what TV was trying to show right TV was about that TV didn't want to see a widowed family they want to see a complete family you know I use that word in quotes because you know their idea of what respectable looks like means that you know father mother children etc not knowing that there was supposed to be a father in the first place on the show, on the show. but um, really, it took up some issues that are like, all right, yeah, this is uh, sometimes painful. You mean serious, but like, yeah, painful too. It's like, damn, like that is the state of blackness in, in America, and it, it's tough to deal with. And like, kind of, I uh, guess we can kind of chuckle sometimes through it. You know what I mean? But especially through JJ character, where they kind of like started to make that a little too on the nose. But yeah, it really was about just like, all right, um, how can we mine through this this very serious issues and find some levity into it? But I felt the same way, you know what I mean? And, and I think that that's why it's kind of hard to write that chapter because one, there's so much stuff I've written about it already. So for me, that chapter I wanted to write, really focus on like John Amos and Esther Roll. John Amos is known about, but I wanted to get deep into why he was so important in that show, why he was written off. The history people know, people don't know the history of like why and what he really, from the jump, advocated for Esther Roll did as well but she was a star he wasn't so she couldn't they can easily kick her off 
they could easily get rid of him. So that's why I wanted to get into the politics of that show. Like that show was more so about the chapter is more so about like the dynamics of the network and how they kind of pick and choose who they think is important. And um, yeah, that's why that show is so important to me because too it like changed the dynamics of the seriousness of the tone, but also what these actors they came to the show wanting to change how folks saw black people. And I can't say that for Red Fox, or I can't say that for, for uh, Sherman Hemsley either in like you know the Jeffersons. But this show for sure, it's on record. They came to the show in order to change and redeem the black image. And I think that that's the, well, this show was like the one that's meant to be the most political, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the only of the shows. This only one that's actually created by a black person too, you know. So that changes the dynamic of like kind of um, the tone of it. So I, I think there's definitely a distinction when you look at these three shows. They're all extremely different. Um, but I had thought it's important to talk about them cohesively because coming from the same production house but what they were able to do to show blackness in different lights was so important to me okay so it's Luis and george and the jeffersons right yes and i felt like george i guess the book kind of confirmed this it i felt like george he was existing obviously but i felt like his impact was kind of minimal at times because yeah. Like you really didn't know what he thought about the world. Like yeah. he, he always had this kind of like a guards up image, mm -hmm. like very stoic. Yeah, and you never yeah. really felt that he, he also took the world seriously, but you just didn't get that side of him, I guess. Yeah, he's very I much felt like that. His wife was more or less the protagonist. Of Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's more like the pure actor. He comes comes to do important game best. Like he's a real thespian, like Sherman Hemsley. Um. And Must is not known about his personal life either. You know, he had roommates and stuff. He lived like a free life. He's very kind of, um, folks may say, you know, alternative, hippie, whatever word you want to use, free thinking, free loving, right? That's what folks know about Sherman Hemsley, right? But he's just an amazing actor. And, you know, I think he was, he was like 12 years, um, Isabel Sanford, who played Louise, he's about 12 years her junior as well. Like he's much younger than her too. And even on the spinoff, right? Uh, spinoff of All in the Family, we always saw the son Lionel and 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 Luis on the show, but we didn't see we didn't see uh, George Jefferson on the show until about the fourth season of the show, because um, they didn't have an actor to play him, so they kind of just kept him as an ominous figure. Mm. When he came on the show, he became like this funny guy who would like battle with Archie Bunker on All in the Family before they kind of had their spinoff. But really, yeah, it was Isabel Sanford who had been there from the jump from All in the Family to uh, the Jefferson. So like. In a lot of ways, she was the primary character, but the antics, the performance, and the acting of Sherman Hemsley as George became the star, right? Mm -hmm. She was there first, and even they even said, too, uh, I think I mentioned this in the book, they mentioned to her, like, oh, we want you to see if you like him. If you approve of him, we're going to make him George. <laughs> so, like, they kind of wanted her, because they respected her enough. She said, yeah, I guess it'll work out. And they realized how good their banter is one another, so it worked out well. But he became a star purely from his acting ability, purely from his like performance as this character. Not necessarily like he was not necessarily written as as the star, but realizing all right, this is the person that we need to build around, right? So different from like you know Esther Rolle, she was the star undoubtedly. Red Fox was the star undoubtedly as well too. This show was kind of like complicated because who was first, but also like who had the bigger, the louder impact. Now that, well, that was for sure Sherman Hemsley as George Jefferson, but yeah. As you've seen that in that chapter, I can only say so much about him because there's not a lot to say. He He's not known for going against folks. He's not known for doing this. He's known for kind of coming in and doing his job. And he's known for his the role he's playing versus Isabel Sanford. There's so much more about her uh, having some power, you know, in, in the spheres of influence of the show as well, too. Well, Dr. Adrian Sebro, this is a wonderful episode. Yeah, glad to be here. I appreciate, I appreciate you a lot. And we definitely want to have you back onto the show at a later time. Yeah. I, feel like, I, love I feel like we could talk a long time about things, mm -hmm. but in case my audience member or anyone had a question or comment for you, what would be the easiest way to get in touch with you? Yeah, my email, um, A-S-E-B-R-O at, at, excuse me, at utexas.edu. I can write that down somewhere. Um, but yeah, A-S-E-B-R-O at utexas.edu. Uh, or you can find me on LinkedIn or anything like that at all. I, I would, you know, Love being in conversation with anybody. 
um love talking about this work and i would just like yeah any i'm i'm open to talk about anything at all like anything about media history television black film etc um i just love the work i do i love being able to teach about these things and talk about them as well too so any inquiries uh be great and like i said i'm, I'm working on now a, a book about black women comedians and trans going from stand-up to tv to film and uh any talk about that too would be great as well. That sounds good. See, you got me wanting to write now about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I keep the momentum, as you know, writing. You know, publishing. Yeah, <laughs> writing is tough, you know. But when you have a good idea, you like, you got to jump at it and keep momentum because it's an everyday thing. You got to put pieces to it every day as much as you can, you know. So I'm trying to, as I have the momentum now to write again and have a good idea, I like. I want to keep that going. Well, like I said, again, Adrian, this was a treat. I had a great time this episode 143. We can't wait to have you back on. I know my audience is going to be really excited about this episode coming out. I kind of promoted it a little bit. Hey, you guys are going to look like some of these shows you used to like. But, hey, somebody's going to actually analyze and give you a different take on it. And let's see how you like it now. But, yeah, no, right. I love the shows, and I love them even more now, just knowing the history of them. And, um. Again, thanks for coming on to the show, um, Beautiful People. Episode 144, we have Midwest Midwestern Marks Institute coming on tomorrow. Um, there could be an upcoming debate in January that I'm supposed to be the moderator of. So there's just a lot going on this yeah. particular forum. We have people coming on Sunday to discuss the BRICS conference going on in Kazan, Russia right now. And we got election night coverage coming up November 5th, Tuesday night. We're busy. We're busy. So, um, please stay tuned. Um, Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. Have the beautiful rest of your day, and we'll talk soon. Cheers, everybody. Thank you.